Good afternoon, church family. It's good to gather together this afternoon on Good Friday. We are in person and we are online. I saw several people there already. Um, this is nearing very, very close to the cross today. And so we gather today on a Friday at 3 o'clock, the hour that our Savior gave up his life. So we gather with hearts full of worship, hearts full of humility, hearts of expectation. It was a day um, of confusion for the disciples, a day where they didn't think it was going to go down like this. They didn't know Easter was around the corner. Um, so we enter this day with anticipation as well. Let's prepare our hearts. God, we invite you here into this place on this Good Friday 
this holy day of the week, that we remember the journey you took for us. We are so grateful. You loved us first, God. And you invite us into relationship. You invite us into a way of being, a way of living. And your cross stands at the center. of your love for us. And so we draw near to that cross today, to the story that probably most of us are so familiar with. But may its power not be lost on us. May the familiarity not numb us to the incredible love that you have poured out. May your spirit be at work. In your name we pray. Amen like to invite up Marshall to do our first scripture reading for today. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later, later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, see, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At least two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you?
From the Gospel according to Matthew. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. This is the word of the Lord. I'm really thankful that you're here today and to reflect upon with us uh, on the events of Good Friday. The reflection on this day can be difficult for us. It's always been a bit difficult for me. I was raised in a Catholic Italian home, and on Good Friday, um, my mother told us stories of how my grandmother would darken the windows from 12 to 3 with black cloth, and we often were very quiet during that time, and there were three of us ruckus boys, and it wasn't easy to keep us quiet, but we were pretty quiet and pretty solemn. It's always been a difficult and a tough time to reflect on the passion of Christ. It also can be a little confusing to me. The passion of Jesus pulls me in a lot of different directions. Much like the painting here of Jesus being taken down from the cross by Hong Kong artists Wang Lu, it can seem difficult for me to discern my own thoughts. When I first saw this painting, I had to look carefully in a long time to see Jesus in it. This afternoon, 
I would like to briefly share with you how different parts of Good Friday pulled me towards all sorts of different things and invite you into your own private reflection of what today means for you. My prayer is that each of us will hear God, that we'll be more connected to God's work and grace and gift to us on the cross. The first thing that's difficult for me about the readings is the injustice of it all. Jesus is arrested and subject to false testimony immediately. Pilate absolutely drives me crazy. Seems like the one person who should be able to get a hold of this mess. I'm sure he's paid well to do that. And he just gives in to the demands that press upon him so quickly. It feels like there's nothing admirable in what he does. He does nothing to ensure justice or fair treatment. Caphias seems... Caphias seems the same way. He seems to give in to expediency. In the Gospel of John, we read that he says, Do you not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? For me, as someone who was raised up with an expectation of justice and the idea that justice could appear at the last minute, Jesus' silence is difficult as well. Every time I read the Passions, I just want Jesus to say something, anything, to call a witness, to do something that will cause those present to respond to their better natures. I want the scene reversed, but it doesn't reverse. There's no justice, just a horrible miscarriage of justice, rooted in prejudice, fear, and hate. All this injustice would be hard in anybody's case, but I really like Jesus. I could read the Gospels and talk about them. I'm not sure I could read them alone every day, but if you gave me a small group of people that would meet with me every morning to read a piece of the Gospels and ponder them, I think I would be so happy. I love Jesus, the lover of children, women, and the poor. I love Jesus, the comforter, always pushing for love to make a bigger way in the lives of those around him and always pushing for more faith and trust. I love Jesus the frustrating, the God-man who's difficult to understand. Everyone I have ever met who's read the Gospels, believer or not, just loves Jesus. It's hard to see your hero subject to this kind of injustice. It's always invited me to sadness and a bit of hopelessness. This is our God, my hero, and he's being trampled upon. For me, another part of the text that's very difficult is the violence. Death on a cross seems almost beyond horror. In Philippians, Paul writes that Jesus, sorry, I'm behind slides here, oops. Hmm. In Philippians writes that, that Paul writes that Jesus humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. There's something uniquely difficult about death on a cross, uniquely horrible. All this violence to the Son of Man, all this violence towards a man who preached a gospel of love, of forgiveness, of restoration, and of increased access to God. I really want humanity to be better than this, and I want God to be treated better. Finally, there are a few unusual things that make Good Friday particularly difficult to understand. One is that this Jesus felt forsaken by God. Jesus says, asks, why has he been forsaken? He seems alone on the cross to suffer, die, and bleed. I hate separation from those I love dearly. We all do. It's in us. It's in us to want to be connected. I don't know if any of us could ever understand what is it like for Jesus to be separated from his Father. The other source of confusion and pain, which seems often beyond my grasp, is that the iniquity of us all was placed upon him. What are we to make of this? On the personal level, I wonder if he sometimes, if he, if he actually felt the damage I do to the world when I use the opportunities I have been given for selfish ends. I wonder, was Jesus physically present to the hurt that I cause to those I love the most? On a larger scale, I wonder if Jesus was somehow present in mind or body and spirit 
to all the horrors that greed and violence have created. Good Friday just seems difficult to take in. The one thing that stands in contrast, of course, to all this difficulty is that through these things, all this injustice and horror, we are greatly benefited. This is the part of Good Friday that pulls at me and you so differently. I get this, and most of us get this part so quickly. After his own conversion, the great evangelist Charles Wesley wrote, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Isaiah writes, Surely he took upon our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The moment of his conversion, Wesley, the cross is all joy to Wesley, and it is all loved. When we behold the cross in this way, we realize the great gift of love, that someone would do this for us, and how can we be but overjoyed at what that accomplishes in our lives? The iniquity of us all the Lord has laid on him. So I feel conflicted on Good Fridays, pulled in different directions. I'm sorry that any man or woman who lived a life of love, born of the Spirit of God, ended up on a tree. It just grieves me. And I might as well try to comprehend how the galaxies are created than to try to understand what it means that Jesus felt abandoned by God and that he took all of the world's iniquities upon himself. Yet on the other hand, I'm quietly grateful that upon that cross, the punishment that bought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus is the lifeboat that I climbed into many, many years ago, and his sacrifice on that cross took me to shore. By his wounds, I believe I was healed and am being healed. I offer my personal reflection on this day for your own thinking. What touches you this afternoon in your recollection and reflection about the cross? What part of this day speaks to you? Of course, our prayer on staff is that Jesus will meet you in the recollection of the love in love and grace, which is the way he does things. Before I release you and we release ourselves to that reflection through communion, I do want to offer you two pastoral thoughts. First of all, let me say that wherever you are in your reflection of Good Friday, you are welcome here today. This event comes at us different ways, and wherever you are in your reflection of this event, you are welcome here today. Whether you are conflicted, joyful, full of sorrow, or confused, whatever you reflect upon, however this great event comes to you, you are welcome here. We're big at welcoming a community. You and your reflection of Good Friday are welcomed here. Let me say, too, that I hope you will not feel too worried if all of this is hard to tie down in your head and heart. On this day, we hold fast to the witness that the God-man was convicted of a crime he never committed, crucified by an occupying power, and that in this event, God was calling all of humanity and all of creation back to God. If that's a bit too much for you to take in in one afternoon, I wouldn't be too worried. We shouldn't think that the dealings of God who spun the universe 
are always going to be easily assimilated. Awe and confusion are often partners in our souls. Sit in the mystery or the sadness or the joy of the cross with an open heart, and I suspect God will meet you there. Let me say that again. We welcome you to sit in the mystery or the sadness or the joy of the cross with an open heart, and we hope and pray and expect that God will meet you there. God's name be praised in all of this, in our reflection, in our sorrow, in our deep gratitude. Amen. I'd like to invite up Matthew for our third and final reading. Um, Matthew 27, 32 to 37 and 41 to 50. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. God, we thank you for the incredible life that you lived and gift that you gave to us. On this day we call Good Friday. God, each of us comes to the cross in our own way. We might be confused. Our hearts might be breaking. We might be full of gratitude, and we might have all of those things at the same time. But we thank you that you invite us to encounter you, to receive forgiveness, to be restored, and to be transformed. God, we confess our need for you. We repent of ways that we think we should be at the center of our lives, of the ways we put ourselves over others. God, we come to you with all of what's in our heart, and we lay it at your feet. And we seek your forgiveness. Jesus, we thank you that you are so generous in your forgiveness. We thank you for the gift of life. We know it costed you. May we never take it for granted. In your name, amen. Last night we gathered here 
um, with Hope for All, our, our church plant and community church, celebrating Monday, Thursday, that last supper, um, this supper that we get to take now, communion, the Eucharist, this meal that we remember Jesus did on this night he was betrayed that he continued to pour himself out to all of those present, those who were going to deny him, betray him, those who would abandon him on this Good Friday at the cross. He continued to love. Loved them to the end, the scripture says. So we remember that meal. Remember the words that he said, that his body would be broken, that his blood would be poured out so that we could experience new covenant with the Father. We remember that he said those words on the eve before he would go to the cross and make it real for all of us. The weight that he carried, the weight that he carried for us. His body was broken. His blood was spilled. so that we could have life. We're going to have an extended time. Um, The worship team will be playing three songs. During this time, you can come forward for communion. Pastor John and I will be up here. We take by intinction, and that just means you dip the bread into the cup. The clear glass has wine, and the other one is juice. We have a cross set up over here to my right with candles and cushions. If you want to kneel and pray, if you want to light a candle of hope, you want to offer your confession. If you want to sing in your seat, if you want to reflect on some of the questions John has raised, we invite God to minister in this time. Everybody that is desiring Jesus, we say, come to the table. Come to the table. Come to receive his grace for you today.
to the cross where you gave everything up you gave your life up for our sins as unworthy as we are Lord you came you did not see all that was wrong with us you just just gave of yourself you gave us life you paid with debt without a second thought Lord Jesus you can transform us and we pray Lord Jesus that coming to the cross seeing the great sacrifice that you have made for us that we would be transformed that our hearts like the leper spots can disappear that our hearts made of stone Jesus, thank you for the cross and thank you that you paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray.
the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all you. Yes, I'm in all you. Forty days ago, we gathered on a Wednesday night to mark the beginning of this journey to the cross. We put ashen crosses on our foreheads, remembering that Jesus' life was going to take him to his death. We mark that today. We walk in that today. In a couple of minutes, um, Gwen and Malika will come up and strip the altar and the Christ candle, and we'll walk it out in silence. And I'll invite us to keep silence in this place um, as you exit. If you want to talk outside the doors, that's great. The cross will still be here if you would like to pray. On Sunday, we'll have a 6 a.m. Easter sunrise service. That will be on the Discovery Bay Ferry Pier and then our regular Easter services at 9.30 and 11.30. That very first Good Friday was not called good. It ended in confusion, sorrow, and sadness. People wandered home. People probably huddled in corners. People were weeping. This was not how it was supposed to end. They were confused. They hadn't yet grasped Christ's message that he was giving his life for us. Jesus, we thank you for the incredible journey you took on our behalf. May we draw a little nearer to you in our reflection of what you have given for us. I pray between now and Easter sunrise that we reflect on, that we partake in all that you have for us. May we be mindful of the journey you took. May we be mindful of our need for you. 
And may we arrive on Sunday with expectation and celebration. Thank you, Jesus, for this journey to the cross.